Well, good morning, everyone. Down here again at Las Vegas Federal Courthouse in Nevada. Um, we're setting up to, this morning um, up here on the uh, main platform. As long as we're not taking pictures of inside the federal courthouse, we've um, been given permission to uh, do our live streams up here out of the wind. So hopefully everyone can hear us better. There's, we're away from the traffic. We actually got palm trees behind us, so it makes it for a good picture. And uh, got Andrea here again, and so. Which makes for a better picture. A better, better picture also. <laughs> well, we had another awesome morning this morning uh, in court. Um, a lot of interesting things coming up. We've got a, several notes. Uh, Andrea does better with notes than I do. But, um, so we'll kind of brief you on everything. One of the two big highlights, I guess, today we'll talk about and one of them is um, is that Todd Engel is no longer allowed to represent himself the rest of the trial. Wow. So we'll bring that up a few times on the live stream so that everybody gets that information out there and gets to know that. But um, yes, he's not allowed to represent himself for the rest of the trial. They've, uh, they've His standby counsel is now uh, Mr. George. John George. John George, and he, he's very nervous. He's not... Um, is this a new one? No, it's the, the same so guy. He was fired before, yeah. and they kept him on as co-counsel. And so he actually argued this morning once again to let Todd um, continue representing himself, and the judge was absolutely not. Um, she still hasn't ruled if she will let him do his closing statement or not, so that's still a possibility. But as of now, he cannot speak for himself. And John George, and and mind you, John George is the gentleman who got fired for falling asleep in the uh, courtroom during a. <laughs> during a meeting and then getting up and leaving halfway through and he has not been paying attention any of the times. I mean, one day in court, he was uh, doing Rolling Stones magazine on his computer, I can see because I'm sitting behind him. A pop-up ad comes on, it starts playing in the courtroom and he just slams his computer shut while it's still going and shoves it under the desk like he was in high school. <laughs> and this is the, you know, he's definitely, um, I would say unprofessional and he doesn't have anything together. He doesn't at all. He. Um... He did about uh, less than five minutes of questions on one of the witnesses a day, and he stumbled through it. He probably asked three or four questions at the most, and he seemed very nervous. He was using some of the same lingo. He was looking at notes and using the same lingo that Todd Engel does. And uh, is that correct? That's one of the words that uh, Todd always uses when he's asking the questions, when the other defendants aren't asking that, or their lawyers. So it seemed like he was trying to ask what Todd wanted to ask but um, he wasn't portraying it as well as Todd. Uh, Todd has been doing awesome. He speaks well, he gets his point across, and he's been very uh, personal and friendly to everyone in court. Everyone seemed to like him except for the prosecution, it looks like. So one of the reasons, um, if everyone doesn't know from yesterday, one of the reasons why he is no longer allowed to represent himself, his question, his final question to the witness the other day was, is it true that Dan Love is under a criminal investigation? And that question was not asked and it was objected to by the prosecution. So that simple question, that is a legit question, was denied. So that's why he's no longer allowed to represent himself. I'll let Andrea start here with what's happening today now. So we went into the courtroom this morning right into uh, arguments of Tomasi made of Brady violations and not being able to cross-examine witnesses properly. And this is all pertaining to the information that came out in court yesterday that Greg Burleson is an FBI informant. Um, and he said that for them to learn that in the, for the first time in the courtroom is unimaginable. And there's a host of questions that he still does not have the answer to. He said, um, at this point, they want number one, a mistrial and two possible, or number one, a dismissal and possibly two, a mistrial. The judge comes back and says she doesn't think that is is exculpatory evidence and that is all that the government is uh, required to give the defense. Tomasi said we just don't know. We don't have the information to figure out what um, objections and what motions we need to put forth because they don't have all of the information even today. Just got up and said that this also would have changed his mind and questions during jury selection for certain jurors that have a bias to un undercover agents that have made it onto the jury. Um, 
he may have been different and he may have asked different questions if he had known that there was an FBI informant in the six defendants. The judge, once again, it is not the government's duty to give all information to the defense. <clears throat> Myrie got up and said that information was brought up by the defense and not the government because it was brought up in cross-examination. And then, um, wait, sorry, I missed a page here. I gotta go back. The judge said there was no finding at that time that there had been any violations and would leave it up to the, um, the defense to uh, go through it at the week off and see if they find anything um, to put further motions forward. Then we went right into um, Greg Burleson's. We still have uh, Chris, Chris Johnson, right? That's it, Chris yes. Johnson. On the stand, um, the Longbow interviews, they had finished with Erickson, so they went right into Greg Burleson's. In the beginning, he asked for a shot, an, an additional shot. They bring up the fact that they did feed him alcohol, and he goes in to um, this huge plan and everything that he says. Multiple times he says that he went there to kill federal agents who turned their back on their oath in the Constitution. He's been pagan his whole life, and he has always wanted to die in battle. He went there to take out federal agents who were abusing we the people. Um, he talks about how he grabbed three or four guys to go under the north side skirt, under the uh, uh, under the freeway, the skirt embutment, and um, they were giving hand signals to each other. So this is where all this information, you know, earlier we're talking about all this information, and this is apparently where it all came from, his longbow. Um, he talks about all a bunch of different plans, the militias, um, pre-planning militias in Arizona before they come down, uh, the fact that Greg never actually made it to the ranch before the um, wash happened on the 12th, that they pulled right up into the wash. Um, his entire interview with Greg Longbow is very incriminating. Everything he says in that video is incriminating. Um, he even says at one point that other people were happy that it ended peacefully and he was actually disappointed and that he was hoping they would bring a fight. Um, and so that was pretty much, do you have anything to add of what he was? Well, the Longbow, said? the name of their, um, their uh, documentation that they were doing was called America Reload. And um, one of the defense attorneys asked him, why didn't you call it till the cows come home? It was about the ranchers, about what happened. He said, isn't it because you was trying to attract certain types of people and um, to uh, give you information, acting like you was on their side? So this whole thing, and one of the other attorneys said, this, this is definitely, it's, um, it was a fake documentation. It was fake all the way around. It's a fake name. He asked him, did you pay taxes? Did you get a license for your uh, business as Longbow? For your for your for your uh, documentation thing you're doing, did you sign up with the Better Business Bureau? And he said no to all of those. They didn't have licenses. They didn't pay taxes. All the vehicles that they bought and all the money that they got in was just provided from from the FBI to do this. And any money they was trying to make from it, uh, they didn't pay any taxes on. So that was very interesting. I thought. At, um, you got more to say on that? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I think one of the things that they brought up was the fact that they didn't pay for the van, they didn't pay for the cameras, the lighting, uh, all the snacks and booze that they provided apparently to everyone, and that even though there were thousands of hours of video and Facebook and everything, they still felt it necessary to go out on these fishing excursions with the longbow to, to try to get people to incriminate themselves. Right after Greg's longbow played, Tomasi got up again and motioned to have the, that Greg's Facebook and longbow go only against Greg and not the other defendants. It's obvious that Greg has feelings that the other defendants and all of the other defendants do not. His Facebook, his longbow is so much different than everyone else, and that's what he um, claimed for his motion to have that go only to Greg, and that was denied. Um, they said it came to the conspiracy and that's why it was denied. Give us a second for that to go by. Greg also mentioned on there that um, that he didn't want to be a part of none of these other people because they didn't have the same goals as him. His group of um, militia, uh, which he called um, AIM, America Independent Militia or Arizona Independent Militia, he stated that um, they came for a fight and that the others militias were not 
we're not uh, we're not brave enough to be a part of them. Um, what was the other term they used? Uh, but they, they, even the Oath Keepers were chickens. They went out and they went and got hotels, um, things like that. When we actually, we was there to stand. We, I came there to put some BLM agents six foot under, he stated. Things like that. Absolutely. And very, very incriminating. And it seems like it more enticing people to do something when some of the others didn't do that, such as Eric Parker's uh, statement on Longbow. He said um, his goal was for a peaceful end and he's not a part of a militia. He said he supports the militia, but he wasn't a part of any militia. He also said that when he was up on the bridge, because of guns being pointed at one part, he became very scared, and he didn't think he was gonna to get to go home, so he knelt down and prayed. And um, so these are some of the principal things we're seeing the difference between some of these people. And um, even um, Scott Drexler's, his, uh, his um, video from Longbow was, was very good, very principled, and um, everything that they had in there, they went there because there was uh, people, and Scott Drexler said that um, he went there because there was Americans that needed help, needed someone to stand for them, and he wanted someone to stand for him in case it ever happened like this to him, and it was all peaceful, Absolutely. all peaceful. So we go into cross-examination of Charles Johnson. Um, Jackson gets up and he's basically going right to the fact that um, they are going undercover, they're giving them alcohol, he's had training in, in interrogation. His uh, questions, they call it a script, the guy, uh, Charles doesn't want to call it a script. He said it's, um, it's leading and um, they're talking about what you want to hear. You were feeding them alcohol. Um, he talks about how he, if he had knowledge of how many drinks Greg had had before he got there, if Greg had epilepsy and that drinking could affect his epilepsy. Um, then they talk about a release, a copy of a release statement that they um, had Greg sign or some of the people sign. He did not have that with them, so we were not able to see that. Um, talked about how there was other agents, there was uh, six or seven FBI agents in the room every time someone gave a longbow. None of them was uh, were uh, armed and that they were solicited but came voluntarily is what he said. He asked, was it implied that he would be paid to do the interview? Was it suggested he would become famous or get anything from doing the interview? All was no. I know for sure that that is not true because when Eric did his Longbow, they were talking about when they released it, you get to fly to California for a red carpet event, this, that, and the other thing, so I know that can, can be completely false. Real quick, are any of these videos, is there links available to them, or no. are they holding them just for they evidence? Have them. They have them, it's all in the discovery, okay. we do not have them, but we'll be asking for a copy when it's all over. Um, so then we go into Leventhal, he plays Drexler's video again, and he pinpoints on you can hear Charles Johnson asking the questions in the background and he's like you know here the statement is um, let's pull one out let's see he said that um, he didn't he went there with three people and he said well I went there with Eric and this one other guy that doesn't want his name out there and then the lady Anna says oh we know Steve and it was his daughter's birthday and that's why he wasn't able to show up so they're trying to um, even continually escort information out of these people um, and they did that on the video when they didn't want Steve's name mentioned that they the, these FBI agents there were six of them in that room in that room when they were doing that interview with each one of these defendants Longbow had six FBI agents as a team going around pretending to be this documentation team. They are gonna put this on TV eventually. And so one of the FBI agents behind the, um, behind the camera mentioned Steve's name even after they didn't want his name mentioned. Exactly. Then um, at one point he asked him about the guns and uh, Drexler talks about his guns and the fact that he had an AR. The gentleman then immediately comes back and says, um, did you hear him say that he took an AK because he said, oh, ARs, AKs, all of these things. And the question is, oh, so you had ARs, AKs. And he's like, did you hear him say that he took an AK? But then you say that back during the recorded interview. So they're trying to misrepresent his words and put words into his mouth. And, and the Charles Johnson says, well, I've always said at the beginning of any question, if it, don't let me put words in your mouth. If it's not what you said, please correct me. So they're trying to entrap them into saying something. 
Then he's talking about this long leading question where he's asked what his objective was four different times. It was designed to ask if there was a plan. He's, um, and you know, all of their questions deal with the guns, the plan, who was in charge, who you went with, who you knew there. Um, obviously they were all going into this, um, trying to get information out of these people and have them incriminate themselves. He said, were you aware there were thousands of hours of video on the 12th? And with all that evidence, you still felt the need to go undercover and interview these people um, under this fuss. And that was, yes, basically. He did know that there were thousands of hours of video, but they did so go with this. Um, Jess goes up and plays a bunch more, you know, and they're playing um, Scott Drucklers and Eric Parker's longbows, which were really good. They showed that they are everyday Americans that care about people, that are not to hurt people, and they're not crazy. So they replay everything and bring up, once again, Eric puts, he did not go for violence. He says he's not part of a militia. He said some militias are fine and some are racist, crazy, scary people who want to blow up the government. Um, he was brought up the fact that he was asked, after Eric said he was not part of the militia, he was hammered with these other questions about militia for a long time and the guy said well he was giving us contradicting answers he says he wasn't part of the militia but he planned to go and camp with the militia he doesn't like militias but he trains with militias sometimes so they're trying to basically put words into people's mouths and use that as evidence inside the courtroom john george just went up and asked how many people they interviewed and the answer was several he could have gone more into that but he didn't several. Um, and then if he interviewed his client, and that was just about it. In government redirect, <clears throat> the uh, questions about um, calling and setting up appointments, and that was another FBI agent. Pretty confident that they did record all the calls, but we didn't get to hear any. Um, and then talking about if Burleson seemed impaired and how he states that he didn't. He was a police officer before in Oklahoma, I believe they said in the beginning. And... Um, that he's used to seeing intoxicated people, but he didn't uh, determine that Greg was. He said he wasn't. Asked him if they did a blood test on him to see how maybe al how much alcohol he had, and they said no. Yeah, he didn't do any field sobriety tests or anything like that, and Jackson went up to recross. And um, he says, so it's your statement, he was not impaired. Um, he didn't do any blood alcohol tests on him. He was uh, armed in the room and the other agents were not armed. So he's saying here you're, you're giving the only armed individual in the uh, room alcohol. And he said once they heard about the epilepsy, they stopped feeding him alcohol. Um, and then he brought up how, how uh, big Greg is and the fact that, you know, maybe those two drinks, we don't know how much alcohol was in the two drinks that they handed him a cup and put half of a bottle in that cup and that's one drink. We don't know that, and then the fact of his size could affect how much, how intoxicated he got off of those two drinks, and the fact that he um, seemed excited during his interview, and we, that's pretty much where we left off. We were told we've got to get back in the court here in just a couple of minutes, so we're running late. I'll make two quick notes real quick. One is juror number three is what Eric Parker's attorney made a mention to, that they would had, because of this juror that we have, we would have had um, a total different outlook on this case if we had known that Greg Burleson had been an informant, informant, you know, for the federal government. That we would have not possibly had this juror number three. I will have to get in more detail on that later, uh, but that's um, a big point that uh, we are concerned about. Is juror number three and the, def the defense team? They're concerned about that, and. Um, Mr. Johnson filed a seal under motion to the court that no one else has read but the court. Jackson. Or Mr. Jackson, I'm sorry. Mr. Jackson, Greg Burleson's um, lawyer. lawyer. So we don't know what that motion's about. It's under seal with the court. And uh, that's something we're wanting to find out more about, too. We were just reading that this morning. It was dated August 1st, 2016. So he filed it sometime back. And there's a lot of things that it looks like that the other defendants and their lawyers have been kept in the dark and some things have been kept secret here. So Another thing I wanted to bring up is we have a lot of new faces down here today. Um, on the prosecution side, there was 10 people witnessing. A lot of these are FBI agents, the case agent, people that you know, come in. Today, we have 12 on the defense side, so that is fabulous. There's new people. There are people that saw our live stream yesterday and came down today. Um, people from out of state.
state. I think we have Washington and California represented here today. So I wanted to thank everybody because having more people here, it it helps our guys up there. It they does. They see more people. They smile at everyone. Um, it gives them a little extra strength in the courtroom. It does. And we had a couple of homeschooled mothers come by with their children down here too and, and shook our hands. And we gave them pocket constitutions and some uh, citizen handbooks to their children. And we signed them and done different things. So that was kind of awesome to have them, them two families show up. Also, one more point on the Constitution. They gave us permission today when we walked it to the court to have a pocket Constitution in our pocket that we had to turn it around backwards and we cannot let it face this way out. If that picture's facing out, it's banned in the courtroom. We were told this to several of us this morning. We have to turn it around backwards if we continue to carry the Constitution in the courtroom. This is the only way it can be presented. So again, um, Government tyrant, tyranny right there at the courtroom telling us how we can even carry the cop pocket constitution. It's just amazing at what they're doing. But uh, we better get, out, get off for now. We will be back later. We're already late back to the courtroom. And um, we want to hurry up and find out what's going on. God bless and thanks. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. Down here again at Las Vegas Federal Courthouse in Nevada. Um, we're setting up to this morning um, up here on the uh, main platform. As long as we're not taking pictures of inside the federal courthouse, we've um, been given permission to uh, do our live streams up here out of the wind. So hopefully everyone can hear us better. There's, we're away from the traffic. We actually got palm trees behind us, so it makes it for a good picture. And, uh, got Andrea here again, and so. Which makes for a better picture. You know? A better picture also. <laughs> We had another awesome morning this morning uh, in court. Um, a lot of interesting things coming up. We've got a, several notes. Uh, Andrea does better. Definitely, um, I would say unprofessional, and he doesn't have anything together. He doesn't at all. He um, he did about uh, less than five minutes of questions on one of the witnesses a day, and he stumbled through it. He probably asked three or four questions at the most, and he seemed very nervous. He was using some of the same lingo. He was looking at notes and using the same lingo that Todd Engel does. And uh, is that correct? That's one of the words that uh, Todd always uses when he's asking the questions, when the other defendants aren't asking that or their lawyers. So it seemed like he was trying to ask what Todd wanted to ask, but um, he wasn't portraying it as well as Todd. Uh, Todd has been doing awesome. He speaks well, he gets his point across, and he's been very uh, personal and friendly to everyone in court. Everyone seemed to like him except for the prosecution, it looks like. So one of the reasons, um, if everyone doesn't know from yesterday, one of the reasons why he is no longer allowed to represent himself, his question, his final question to the witness the other day was, is it true that Dan Love is under criminal investigation? And that question was not asked and it was objected to by the prosecution. So that simple question, that is a legit question, was denied. So that's why he's no longer allowed to represent himself. I'll let Andrea start here with what's happening today now. So we went into the courtroom this morning right into... Uh... ...with notes than I do, but um, so we'll kind of brief you on everything. One of the two big highlights, I guess, today we'll talk about, and one of them is... Um, is that Todd Engel is no longer allowed to represent himself the rest of the trial. Wow. So we'll bring that up a few times on the live stream so that everybody gets that information out there and gets to know that. But um, yes, he's not allowed to represent himself for the rest of the trial. They've, uh, they've His standby counsel is now uh, Mr. George. John George. John George, and he, he's very nervous. He's not... Um, is this a new one? No, it's the, the same it's guy. Fired yeah. and they kept him on as co-counsel and so he actually argued this morning once again to let Todd um, continue representing himself and the judge was absolutely not um, she still hasn't ruled if she will let him do his closing statement or not so that's still a possibility but as of now he cannot speak for himself and John George and and mind you John George is the gentleman who got fired for falling asleep in the uh, courtroom <laughs> during a during a meeting and then getting up and leaving halfway through and he has not been paying attention any of the times. I mean, one day in court, 
he was uh, doing Rolling Stones magazine on his computer, I can see because I'm sitting behind him. A pop-up ad comes on, it starts playing in the courtroom, and he just slams his computer shut while it's still going and shoves it under the desk like he was in high school. <laughs> and this is the, you know, he's 